1909. Explorer G.E. Kincaid embarked on a daring adventure down the Colorado River and through the Grand Canyon. Kincaid's motivation stemmed from a desire to explore the area's abundant mineral resources, such as gold, silver, and copper, before it would be permanently closed off. President Teddy Roosevelt sought to declare the Grand Canyon off-limits to timber and mining operations in 1908. While exploring the canyon, around 40 miles upstream from the El Tovar Crystal Canyon, Kincaid noticed intriguing stains in the sediment formation approximately 2,000 feet above him. Anchoring his boat, he disembarked to investigate. Although there was no discernible trail, Kincaid embarked on a short hike and stumbled upon a fascinating sight concealed beneath desert brush. A series of sandstone steps intricately carved into the side of the canyon, leading to a high shelf. Intrigued, Kincaid ascended the steps until he reached a man-made cavern entrance. Equipped with his flashlight, Kincaid ventured into the cavern, illuminating walls adorned with writing. However, to his surprise, the inscriptions were not in English or any Native American language, but rather ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. As he peered into the distance, Kincaid realized that the tunnel extended far beyond what he initially comprehended. Little did he know that his astonishing discovery would ultimately result in his disappearance, as if he had vanished without a trace and would never be heard from again. The Grand Canyon, renowned for its breathtaking beauty and enigmatic allure, captivates observers with its seemingly infinite depths and awe-inspiring vastness. For countless centuries, this remarkable natural wonder has held profound significance as a sacred site among Native American tribes, serving as a spiritual beacon and a testament to their rich cultural heritage. Eleven distinct indigenous groups, including the Havasupai, Hopi, Paiute, Navajo, and Zuni people, have long resided in or explored the Grand Canyon region, considering it not merely a stunning national park, but an integral part of their creation narratives and religious beliefs. The Havasupai, who have gracefully coexisted with the canyon for generations, perceive it as a gateway to both paradise and damnation, shaping their unique interpretation of heaven and hell. According to Havasupai belief, the souls of the departed traverse the canyon to reach their ultimate destination. Consequently, the Grand Canyon holds deep spiritual significance, serving as a meeting point of past and present, where the physical realm intertwines with the metaphysical. The geological features and awe-inspiring vistas of the canyon are not merely a spectacle for these tribes, but an inseparable part of their beliefs, traditions, and cultural identity. This marvel of nature, however, did not materialize overnight. It is the remarkable outcome of millions of years of erosion and geological activity. According to Hopi mythology, this majestic canyon was the birthplace of the first humans who were once lizard people. These reptilian shapeshifters emerged from the Grand Canyon and evolved into humans. If they were going to start their journey somewhere, it had to be in a place as remarkable as this, don't you think? When Kincaid realized that the tunnel was deeper than what he initially expected, he cautiously advanced further into the dimness of the surroundings. Methodically, he recorded detailed observations of everything he encountered. The primary passageway, approximately 12 feet wide, gradually narrowed to 9 feet as he ventured deeper. Around 57 feet from the entrance, the first side passages appeared, branching off to the right and left. Along these passages, numerous rooms of varying sizes, akin to contemporary living rooms, were discovered. Some measured as large as 30 by 40 feet square. Access to these rooms was granted through oval-shaped doors, and round air spaces within the walls facilitated ventilation. The passages were skillfully chiseled or hewn in straight lines, indicative of a deliberate engineering layout. It dawned on G.E. Kincaid that he had stumbled upon an immense complex. He estimated that this underground city could have accommodated as many as 50,000 inhabitants. Exploring further, he encountered granaries stocked with shelves of glazed pottery, some of which still contained seeds. Cooking areas and a vast dining hall were also discovered, while ancient artifacts filled the rooms. Kincaid meticulously wrapped a few small metal and ceramic objects to examine later. In one particularly spacious chamber, he identified it as a metalworking area, a technological feat seemingly incongruous with the region. 
Here we found tools of all descriptions, made of copper. These people undoubtedly knew the lost art of hardening this metal, which has been sought by chemicals for centuries without results. Kincaid realized that to comprehensively explore the entirety of this underground city, he would require assistance. Upon sending a selection of artifacts and his detailed notes to the Smithsonian, Kincaid requested financial and logistical support, recognizing the significance of his archaeological discovery as one of the most profound to date. The Smithsonian, after a few weeks, agreed to provide assistance. Professor S. A. Jordan arrived with a team of approximately 40 scientists, researchers and laborers ready to undertake the excavation and exploration of the ancient underground city. With increased illumination and manpower, the scientists swiftly realized that the layout of the cave system was not haphazard, but rather meticulously designed and symmetrical. The tunnels all converged towards a central chamber. Within this central chamber stood a grand statue. Over a hundred feet from the entrance is the cross hall, several hundred feet long, in which are found the idol or image of the people's god, sitting cross-legged with a lotus flower or lily in each hand. The cast of the face is oriental, and the carving this cavern. The idol almost resembles Buddha, though the scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents. Taking into consideration everything found thus far, it is possible that this worship most resembles the ancient people of Tibet. Consequently, Kincaid's team, acknowledging the significance of the discovery, christened the complex the Citadel. Among the larger rooms uncovered was the crypt. The walls slanted at an angle of approximately 35 degrees, with rows of mummies occupying distinct shelves. At the head of each mummy was a small bench, accompanied by copper cups and fragments of broken swords. Some mummies were covered in clay and wrapped in bark fabric. Notably, all the examined mummies thus far were male, implying that this specific section might have served as the barracks for warriors. Kincaid, Jordan, and the Smithsonian team were overwhelmed by the wealth of evidence indicating that this was not merely a remote temple inhabited by a few priests, but rather an extensive city that had accommodated thousands of men, women, and children for several centuries, if not millennia. The pressing question that eluded any conclusive answer was the identity of these ancient inhabitants. Two points emerged as consensus among the researchers. Firstly, the civilization responsible for constructing the citadel possessed a remarkable level of advancement, surpassing the native tribes that inhabited the region for thousands of years. They exhibited expertise in working with bronze, predating the recognized Bronze Age. Additionally, they demonstrated an understanding of specialized labor divisions and agricultural practices at a time when other societies were still assumed to be hunter-gatherers. These findings challenged the mainstream theories of archaeology and anthropology. The second point of agreement among the researchers was that this enigmatic civilization did not originate locally. Instead, evidence strongly suggests that they had arrived at the Grand Canyon from a distant part of the world, either from Egypt or Asia. Kincaid and Professor Jordan took the initiative to dispatch crates containing artifacts, along with comprehensive notes and illustrations, to the Smithsonian Institution. Kincaid expressed the need for additional resources and an expanded team to facilitate further exploration of the Citadel. Regrettably, their request for additional support and resources was declined. Following this decision, all communication from G.E. Kincaid and Professor Jordan ceased, and their whereabouts remain unknown. Is this because they never existed, or because they'd seen too much? Meanwhile, the airspace above the region, which is now known as Kincaid's Cave, is restricted, making it illegal and dangerous to navigate the area surrounding the pyramid and cave on the ground. Official reports from institutions like the Smithsonian have been censored, altered, invalidated, or withdrawn. Despite these measures, people continue to venture into this section of the canyon. Numerous individuals have been arrested, and some have lost their lives while attempting to scale these sacred locations throughout the years. The situation has escalated to the extent that the government finds it necessary to station armed FBI agents inside the entrance of the cave. When we've researched this topic, it's quite difficult to find information about this mysterious explorer. Could this be an indication that he's just a fictional character? 
The names of G.E. Kincaid and Professor Jordan first appeared on a front-page article of Arizona Gazette on April 5, 1909. It was reported that archaeologists from the Smithsonian Institution found remains of an advanced civilization on the Grand Canyon. However, Smithsonian Magazine states that there are no records confirming the existence of either Kincaid or Jordan. No Egyptian artifacts of any kind have ever been found in North or South America. I can tell you that the Smithsonian has never been involved in anything like this in the Grand Canyon or anywhere. Apart from the Arizona Gazette articles, there is no other evidence or mention of these individuals. It is peculiar that there is no verification of their existence from family, friends, or acquaintances. There is a possible connection between Kincaid and Jordan mentioned in a newspaper report from September 22, 1908, in the Lewiston Evening Teller, which refers to a project called the Stites Excursion Project, involving individuals named G.E. Kincaid and W.J. Jordan. Although the names are similar, the initials do not match. It is likely that the names Kincaid and Jordan in the Arizona Gazette article were inspired by this earlier newspaper report. There are two prevailing theories surrounding Kincaid and the narrative of his discovery on the Grand Canyon. The first theory is that the story is an intricate and highly detailed hoax orchestrated by two ambitious explorers collaborating with a local newspaper. However, this hoax theory lacks substantial credibility. Historically, newspapers primarily aim to inform the public rather than sensationalize events, as they often do in contemporary times. If the journalist had fabricated the entire scenario using his vivid imagination, wouldn't he have sought a national news outlet to amplify the story? If personal fame were the motive, it appears that minimal effort was invested in promoting the narrative. The second theory suggests a deliberate cover-up by entities such as the Smithsonian and other influential powers. According to this notion, these institutions have a vested interest in suppressing any evidence that challenges conventional historical understanding, particularly a discovery of such magnitude. In considering the funding of institutions like the Smithsonian, it begs the question, aside from tax dollars, who else might be contributing to their financial resources? Do you believe that Kincaid existed and was silenced by powerful organizations? Leave a comment and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Until the next one.